January 1990 is when uh, I moved to the island, thinking it was going to be temporary. I thought everything was temporary, you know. I was young and I was moving from place to place a lot. And But there's a legend, oh, I should have probably told you that. There's a legend that says that once you sleep on Fidalgo Island, you always come back. I should have told you that first. <laughs> I was living in Hawaii and I was doing makeup. I was a makeup artist for many years for movies. And um, I moved to Sky Komish. I got married and we decided to change life completely. And we moved to a little village in the mountains called Sky Komish. I decided that that's it. I don't want to be a makeup artist anymore. I want to be like a real person. And I'm going to make sandwiches at the ski resort, at the ski pass. So we did that for a year. And it was just a really harsh reality check to see how much money we were making per hour versus working on movie sets, you know. And then the second winter, there was no snow. So the pass didn't ha didn't open till really late. And we were really broke. And we had an exchange student living with us and my brother, and we couldn't support ourselves. And my agent from Hawaii, my makeup agent, came to visit and we were talking with her and she said, oh, my parents bought 10 acres on an island called Fidalgo Island and they're looking for somebody to take care of the property. Would you be interested? And we thought, oh, never heard of it. We might as well go check it out. So on my birthday in December 1989, we took a drive and you know, drove on to Fidalgo for the first time, checked out the property and it was just cool. And we thought, you know, we probably it'd be probably easier to make a living here than up there. So we said, okay. So we packed, went back to Skykomish, packed everything, dogs, cats, exchange student, my brother, and all moved into the little trailer. And one winter I thought, oh, I want to start gardening. So I studied everything I could find on gardening. And in the spring, we started this huge garden. So I started a business called the Porcupine Garden. And I started selling herbs all over the area. I went to see this customer and asked him if he thought he would buy enough basil to keep me busy for the winter. And he just opened a little catering business. And we talked about basil. But before I left, he said, so what do you think I need for my store? What's going to make it even better? And I have no idea why I said that. I said, I think you should have cookies on the counter. Mm -hmm. And he said, good, go make them for me. And I thought, well, I don't know how to bake. What a weird thing to ask me to do. You know, I don't bake cookies. So I drove home and I thought, okay, fine. I'm going to make him cookies. So to make a long, very long story short, that's the story of my book. I made him cookies and the cookies became really famous and popular. Then I made more cookies. And six months later or eight months later, we had a bakery. <laughs> We had a bakery called La Vie en Rose, who um, was kind of a magical place. Just it was beautiful. It looked kind of like Paris. You walked in and it felt like Paris. Because we had a, a friend paint a gorgeous mural on the wall of me holding bread and then my two kids on each side. It looked like a fresco, like something. I think I have a picture I can show you. Of um, There were two angels. And just it was just a beautiful place. It smelled good. It had beautiful display cases with all kinds of stuff and always wonderful people working there so people came from everywhere we had tourists and fishermen and and locals and, and so we always had this community lots of kids lots of it was just great it was just an amazing place really really amazing place but very hard work too i mean it never sleeps Well, we had the bakeries for eight years and it was hard. It was a lot of work. I got sick towards the end while I was pregnant with my third child. It took a big toll on us, really. And um, eventually we sold them. My dad died. We sold the bakeries. I got really sick. And then our marriage collapsed. So we separated and sort of began a bit of a survival mode. I had no idea what I was going to do next. I had, the kids were really little. 
I invented all kinds of ways to make a living, but I kept thinking that um, I could make a living gig by gig. It hadn't quite hit me that this was going to be where I was going to live for the next 15, 20 years because that's where my kid's dad lived. So one day after going to Florida to see my mom, I came back to Anacortes and it hit me that this is it. This is for real. I better get used to living here for good. Just make my peace with... If I told myself that I was stuck, I was going to go crazy. So I kind of had to embrace the fact that this is where my home was going to be for the next 20 years or Mm -hmm. 15 years. So one day on, on a complete whim, I was driving home, but... I kept driving and I drove to the airport. We have a little airport here in Anacortes. And the kids were asleep in the back of the car and I woke them up and and went to talk to the guy who flies the planes over the islands and we booked a little flight and the three kids and I got on the plane and we, I told the guy, just take me wherever you're going. I just need to see this place I'm up above. So he took us with us on his, I don't know what he was doing, some delivery route or something. And the kids thought that was so much fun. And I was petrified because actually I really don't like being in planes at all. So I don't know why I did that. But actually, actually I do. I needed to um, just grab the beauty of this place. This place is amazing. It's it's so beautiful. The, when you fly above it, it's all this water with these little sprinkles of, of islands. And at low tide, there are way more islands than at high tide. But when you fly over it, it's magical. It's unique. I, I don't know if there's anywhere else in the world that has that particular geography so I just flew above and I did this thing that my son talks about a lot now he says I don't want to accept anything I want to embrace it and he he has kind of a a sweet little philosophy Mm -hmm. and that's what I did that day I just flew over and I just said this is my home and I'm gonna love it and I'm gonna embrace it and that's where I'm gonna be for a long time and it seemed to have worked. When we got off the plane, I, I was a lot more peaceful. And, and I actually started a whole new career right that week, I think, once I settled into knowing that this is where I was going to be. So I became a life coach and a writer. And that's what I've been doing for eight years now.